and we look forward to lots of engagement in the chat box and hearing all the expertise that our panelists are going to share with you today. This is one of our most popular sessions that we offer each year on Job Club. Just hearing from people in recruiters and HRs, um, professionals' roles, uh, we can all learn so much from their side of the table that will benefit us in our job search. Again, use that chat box. Let us know where you're joining us from and what type of work you're looking for. An overview of today's program. I will have a welcome success stories. Then we'll have our panel. Afterwards, we'll have a sharing of active job leads, um, partner updates, and then we'll give you a sneak peek of what's going on next time in Job Club. Next. The mission of Job Club is to provide a positive environment for job seekers to network and learn best practices for the job search. We meet the second and the fourth Tuesday of each month, and you can find our schedule on our website. Uh, it's also on Extension's website. You can find it as well on the UK Alumni Association website, www.ukalumni.net forward slash job club. Our team I'm Caroline Francis, Director of UK Alumni Career Services. I'm joined by Diana Doggett, Extension Specialist, Special Projects. Nicole Waite, who's on our panel today, is our representative from UK Steps Temporary Employment. Behind the scenes, uh, we have Sunny, Suzanne, um, Lindsay, lots of people behind the scenes, Queen helping us make today possible. So grateful for our team that brings you Job Club. The Job Club format is hybrid. Um, since COVID, we are in a hybrid format. Um, for those that are local or close enough to drive in, we always encourage you to come in person because of the incredible networking. After job club meetings, um, we do spend time with people that have come in person um, to help them more with their job search. So if you are local, we encourage you to do that. Otherwise, continue to join us by Zoom uh, or Facebook Live. You'll notice there's a link to a resource packet that has some incredible articles that we've sourced on all things related to your job search. Um, you will receive that link in the newsletter, the follow-up newsletter. So please take a look at those very good resources that'll help you in your job search. Employers and recruiters are always welcome to join us at Job Club. In-person guests may have a one minute spotlight to share active job leads, and that'll happen later in the program. We do have at least one employer here today. There may be a few others that join us, but please watch your email. Later today, we're going to send you a newsletter with job leads that have been mailed to us since the last Job Club meeting. But in the interim, we do recommend that you check out our LinkedIn page. Sometimes employers also send us a job lead and there's a quick turnaround. So please use that LinkedIn group as well. More information on that will be in the newsletter, but that's also a really good resource um, with lots of additional job leads from all types of jobs and industries. Some attendees at Job Club are conducting a confidential job search. So we ask people you may see in person or notice a name in the chat box that you respect the privacy of that person and keep their job search confidential. Please note also recordings of past Job Club presentations are on our website. 
a welcome to first timers. Uh, word of mouth seems to be one of the most popular ways that people learn about Job Club. It's always nice to have friends looking out for friends. And we do have a few guests today that were encouraged to come by a friend. Uh, but first timers, later today, you will get a survey that will put you in our system that will help give you advance notice of our Job Club meetings and registrations. So watch for your email. We love success stories. That's the highlight of Job Club for our facilitators that work so hard putting it on. So when you land that next job, please let us know. Email, let us know about your success. We want to celebrate with you. Also in the chat box, please let us know some of your recent successes along the way. Um, let's take a moment now, and if you've had a recent success, please let us know in the chat box. Maybe you've had an interview. Uh, perhaps you've updated your resume or your LinkedIn profile. Uh, perhaps you've scheduled a networking coffee. Those are all successes in our eyes. Please take a moment and share some of your good news with us. I know I have a lot of clients right now that are getting interviews, so that's good. Just a moment and see if anything comes in to share in your joy and excitement of a success. Okay, we will move along. Now straight to our panel. Thrilled to have our panelists today. These are longtime supporters of Job Club and have been speakers and panelists for us in the past. We have Dustin Lewis, Nicole Waite, and Rodney Warwicks. They have all been in the recruiting field, hiring field for many years, and we're gonna definitely benefit from their side of the table, sharing what it's like on their side of the table and how we can take that to um, learn and become a better job seeker and be more successful in our efforts. I have a list of questions prepared for the panelists. We will also take questions uh, in the chat box. We'll send those to the panelists near the end of the presentation panel, but we'll get to a few of our prepared questions first, and then please send us your questions as well. Um, I'd like to take a moment and let each of our panelists share uh, their name, what type of company they work for, and what they are actively recruiting for before we go into the questions. Dustin, why don't you begin? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Caroline. Um, as she said, my name is Dustin Lewis. I am the uh, recruiter practice lead for Actalent Talent Solutions. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Actalent, we're the world's largest privately owned uh, engineering services and talent acquisition provider. Um, my job as a recruiter is to connect uh, engineers, uh, engineering professionals with meaningful career opportunities. Uh, some of the companies that we work with locally here in the Lexington area include uh, Toyota is by far our biggest customer. Um, we also uh, recruit for Ford and Louisville, and then uh, all of the Hitachi plants here in Central Kentucky. So I'm uh, I'm in year five working uh, with Actalent. Thank you, Nicole. All right, gotta unmute there, Carol. Thank you. Hi. So for those who don't know me, I'm Nicole Waite, and I am an employment specialist here at the University of Kentucky. In our human resources department. We have a temporary, um, I should say, temporary employment department, not a temporary career department, but we have temporary employment and we have career employment, and I'm part of that temporary team. And so what we do is we help to onboard um, employees who are interested in uh, part-time positions, full-time positions. Uh, attempt to hire in regular positions, a variety of positions. Uh, we backfill, um, let's say someone's out for an extended leave for med you know, medical leave or a department may simply be waiting for approval of, for example, for like a budget or something like that to fill positions. Basically we fill a variety of positions here in STEPS. And STEPS is a great way, as I always mention, to get your foot in the door with the University of Kentucky if you're interested to build up those skills. Um, 
those skills get a little feel for a, a new career, a, a new grads, a second career, whatever it may be. Uh, we also offer uh, medical, dental, and vision insurance. A lot of people are not aware of that. But overall, SEPS is a great way to get your foot in the door with the University of Kentucky. Thank you. Rodney? Hi, yes, uh, Rodney Warricks. I am a technical recruiter with Anchor Point Technology. Uh, my office, again, is based out of Louisville. Uh, corporate office is Indianapolis. We take care of most of the Midwest region. Um, we're looking for IT roles, uh, anything that supports IT roles from BAs to project management, even down to help desk as well. Uh, we work with, uh, in Lexington, uh, we work with uh, Great Construction, Temper Sealy. We go to Frankfurt, Custom Data Processing. And then most uh, any entity that has IT support in Louisville, we try to have a connection with them there. Awesome. Thank you. The first question is, I'd like for you to chime in on how COVID has changed recruiting and hiring in what you're seeing um, through your work. How have things changed, the world of hiring and recruiting changed since COVID? Um, Rodney, would you take that one to begin? Well, it's it's really made it to where we have to go on a lot of the interviews without being on site and a lot of the progression of evaluation all through, um, like I say, video screens or phone calls that you have. And sometimes uh, a person may not be able to convey exactly what they have or what they want to uh, present in a Zoom meeting or in a uh, conference call, where if they were in person, they may be a little bit more relaxed or they may be a little bit more confident and could exude, exude confidence that would help maybe uh, present their case a little bit better. So what we're finding is that the people have to be uh, mentally prepared on these um, Zoom interviews or uh, Google Meets or whatever it may be to uh, listen, answer the questions as they are, but still present themselves as they are in an in-person uh, process because uh, I think we're losing out of that uh, in um, uh, internal or personal connection that may help a person understand who they are interviewing or maybe even the interviewee understands exactly who the interview is and uh, can make some uh, personal connections there. So I think we're losing on that personal connection effect at the beginning of the process. Definitely a little bit on both sides. Dustin, would you like to add anything to that on what you're seeing? Yeah, it's, uh, it's changed a lot for us. Uh, before COVID, one of the steps in our hiring process was if we had a candidate either apply for a job online or we called them on the phone, we would you know, make it a priority to meet them in person, whether it's at our office or maybe schedule a lunch. Uh, COVID changed all that. Um, and I, I wouldn't say it's all for the best, you know, the best either, because like Rodney was saying, we, we have lost some of that personal connection on the front end when you're uh, asking them about what their goals, skills and interests are and how those align to the, uh, the job opening that we might have. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot more over the phone or on uh, Teams or Zoom. Um, and I think, you know, one thing we've discovered is we, we kind of miss that. Um, that key piece on the front end. And we're, we've actually in recent weeks made some minor changes to kind of go back to, to what, you know, we were doing before, whether that means, you know, if someone does express interest in a job, we're not just sending their resume to, to Toyota or whoever, like we're actually slowing down and uh, calling them back the next day and just said, hey, you know, did you have a chance to look over the job description? Did you have a chance to research the company? Um, so we're, we're getting back to where we were before, but yeah, I mean, it's changed everything, um, you know, in terms of the face-to-face. -face, and so we're trying to get back to that. Also, what I'm seeing with clients is so many clients want remote or hybrid work, but I'm hearing from employers that they're bringing people back into the office. What are you all seeing um, related to remote and hybrid work? Who'd like to share on that? Hmm. I'll, I'll speak on that one. I can certainly say even with within temporary de, um, employment, first of all, it is highly requested. And, you know, ever since that that movement happened, it's highly requested. And um, more manage, you know, managers and supervisors are even, you know, I should say willing uh, or, or trying to support those um, type of, you know, requests or, uh, you know, to, I guess, 
not just build morale, but just to make the jobs more attractive because truly the applicant pools did drop. You know, we all know that. And, you know, people, you know, see that they can, or should say candidates see that they can get the work done, you know, while working a shorter shift or a shorter weekly schedule or something like that. So um, I should say, you know, it, it wasn't, I don't think it was a welcoming change, you know, at first, but now, you know, there seems to be, it seems to be more welcoming to say, hey, you know, a couple of days remote here, a couple of days in office here. But as Dustin did, I believe it was Dustin that mentioned that there is a, a, a slow movement of some of these supervisors and managers actually wanting, uh, preferring, I should say, for uh, their employees to be back in office. So it was like it was greatly supported and understood, but there has, you know, been a slow shift and more supervisors want the employees in office. Dustin, Rodney, anything you all would like to add on what you're seeing with your employers you're working with regarding hybrid and remote work? I would say in my field where it's IT technology, and if you have an individual that is looking uh, for remote only, you've got to look at this, that if a company is looking at 100% remote, their pool is going to be mean all 50 states and it's going to be a lot wider to look at. So you may think that, OK, I'm a fully qualified candidate in this area that you have. But when you're looking and trying to go and limit yourself just for 100 percent remotes, the candidate pool you're going to be dealing with is going to be a lot larger. And there could be somebody else that is, you know, extremely talented uh, at a better value or, you know, presents them uh, the, uh, a perfect match. And where it's 100% remote, the company is going to go with them. Now, to the point of Nicole is we are seeing the trend of coming back to the office. Uh, I think that the hiring managers and the, the, these, uh, the business owners themselves that have these corporate offices that are sitting there uh, empty, uh, the value of those are not being used. And then there is a camaraderie uh, that is being uh, missed uh, by not having uh, the in-person meetings and the uh, on-site visits of uh, where teams can really go back and forth and not wait for an email response or a, you know, uh, send a message and you wait in 10, 15 minutes if they reply at all. So um, two things is I think the companies are pushing forward to come back in. And then the second of all, if you're in the candidate, and you're only open for remote, remember that the pool you're going to be dealing with is going to be a lot larger uh, scope than somebody, you know, local on site. Great advice. Let's talk about resumes. Resumes are the big way to still get your foot in the door. Um, Dustin, share with us some things that get your attention in a positive way on a resume. What should be people, what should we be seeing on resumes for our candidates? And then also what can get you screened out? Yeah, um, I think for in terms of what could get you screened out, and it's probably my number one pet peeve as a recruiter is applying for jobs that you're not qualified for. Like usually we're pretty, uh, it's pretty standard for us to list the top three skills for a job. And, you know, it's one thing if you have two of the three, but if, if you only have one or it's saying, you know, five years experience in your entry level, uh, that that can definitely waste a recruiter's time because they're taking time out of their day to look at, you know, we don't look at resumes that long, but um, if you don't have the experience that the job posting's looking for, or, um, you know, whether it's an educational piece or number of years experience, like, you know, that's, that's definitely going to get you screened out. Um, as far as like what I like to see on resumes, you know, job tenure is huge. Um, it's a little different in engineering because it is technical and, um, you know, engineers tend to switch jobs probably a little more often than maybe somebody in an administrative role. But, um, you know, the job tenure, unless you're you, you clearly define that you were on contract somewhere, uh, that's definitely, you know, if someone has five jobs in three years. That's definitely a red flag for me. Um, and then, you know, another thing, too, is the, the, the gaps in employment history. Um, I mean, everyone, we're, we're really good and thorough about like asking questions about, you know, why, you know, why did you leave this job or why did you take that job or why did you have, you know, two years here during COVID where you didn't work? And, you know, there's, there's sometimes people have family situations and stuff like that, but, um, you know, just having, um, you know, maybe something on there explaining the gap in employment is helpful to me. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Nicole, what would you add on resume tips, things you'd like to see or what could get people screened out? 
Okay, thanks, Carolyn. I actually wanted to uh, uh, say something about this one. First of all, before I speak about the resume, uh, as far as uh, our department, we do require an application. And so um, many of the resumes will not even get reviewed if that application is not uh, completed. And so I do want to point out, and I know we had a, a, a meeting about that uh, a couple of weeks back with application 101, but uh, completing that application, um, and that's that's so important because there are questions that we have and things that we want to see initially before we even take interest in reviewing that resume. Um, there are just you know some some questions that are that are constant across the board for everyone. Some fair questions that we want to see. Um, but I would say with those resumes, uh, some of the things I, I believe that we've mentioned many a time before is kind of keeping it. I shouldn't say keep it short, but keep it keep it as short as possible. Uh, no more than a couple of pages, if if so. Uh, of course, what's already been mentioned, listing those skills at the top, um, kind of, you know, filtering out anything that's not needed. Something that, you know, that's kind of a, I shouldn't say kind of compares, but actually reviewing the job posting, reviewing the um, job description and highlighting those skills in your resume is really going to be able to grab our attention because those are the things that we're looking for. So I would say moving those skills, having those dates, uh, you know, especially when you're coming comparing that application to a resume, having those dates as, as accurate as you can um, is ideal. And uh, just because we're on the resume and application, I also want to mention, of course, those those um, references also um, having some up to date, accurate references. You know, we don't want to be calling people, and you know, the supervisors or whoever, whomever may be listed are not familiar um, with you or no longer in that role. So, uh, just a couple of things I wanted to mention about those applications also. Because we know resumes are such a foundational piece of the job search, still. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely and are required, I do want to mention that, and they are required for some, uh, with some of those applications, we will require additional documents, whether it be a CV, a uh, resume, a uh, cover letter, things like that. So absolutely, it's still very much needed and requested. Rodney, is there anything you would like to add? It just uh, real quick uh, to the point of the, uh, make it matched up to the job you're applying for and read the job descriptions that you have and talked about the skill sets listed and the skills that you may list down below. Incorporate those into the line items of what you did, and especially in the technologies where I use, we need specific technologies because even though you may do one type of development, this is a, you know, a total different type of development. So just saying I develop systems is not really going to grab the attention. But if you can put the technology or even in like business analysts, the what systems you did your analysis on and how you presented, uh, in, especially in that case, maybe put a dollar amount of what you saved or anything that you can have. But to have a list of big skill sets underneath and then in the body of the resume and the jobs you have, they're not really reflective of you know, what you're doing uh, specifically, you know, we, then that's when we go, okay, well, you got it listed down here, but where did you use it? How did you use it? And so that's where maybe take those skill sets and incorporate it into a line item of each one of your uh, bullet points on your resume. Awesome advice. LinkedIn is becoming through the years so much more important than it was maybe five, 10 years ago. Uh, if you would share with us how you use LinkedIn from your side of the table and advice on what our job seekers and just anyone in as part of their professional development, what they need to be doing and displaying on LinkedIn. Um, Dustin, why don't you take that one to begin? Yeah, for sure. Um, my company, we, we've invested in LinkedIn Recruiter, which I absolutely love because um, it's, it's a little different than regular LinkedIn. It's almost like a virtual resume. So, um, you know, I would concentrate mostly on, you know, having all of your, your employment history on there, just like you would a resume, you know, job title, uh, location, if you can, um, you know, I, th I think there's the ability to fill out a skills section too, which is helpful when it comes to technical recruiting. Um, and then, you know, probably the most important thing for me is like, definitely have your picture on there. Uh, I come across uh, profiles daily, that don't have pictures on there. And it, to me, it's like, you know, as part of that's part of LinkedIn. It's like I don't know why people don't include a picture on there, but it, that to me sometimes gives me uh, the feeling that maybe they're not on LinkedIn that much and don't use it. So like they're probably not going to respond to my message. 
Uh, so those are the big things for me. Rodney? Yeah, uh, same for us, especially the, the photo. And to the sense of it does not necessarily have to be a professional, but have it be of you. And I know you love your dogs and all that stuff that you have, but we're not really recruiting the, the puppies or the animals or anything like that. We, we were recruiting you. So definitely have that. But again, if you're missing out, if you're not using it, like Dustin and I, we are on LinkedIn recruiter daily and uh, evaluating. But as a, uh, if I was on the opposite side, that tool is so critical of being seen what's available, what how recruiters can contact you if you're still open for a job or anything in that nature. So keep it updated. Uh, uh, be on there, you know, weekly. Have the notifications set up to where you, if somebody's reaching out to you, you can respond in a timely manner because I'm, it's all quick to the point. I can, uh, I'm not sure about Nicole. I'm saying it's probably the same with her, but when we get a job, our job, it's our goal to complete it and fill it as quick as possible. And if you're not checking, you're really looking for jobs, but you're not on LinkedIn checking for message or looking for opportunities, then you're going to be missing out a lot. Excellent. So how does that look from a recruiter's communication standpoint, um, communicating with a job seeker? So as a recruiter, let's say you have you use keywords or skill sets to go into your um, side of the tool and search people. So let's say three or four people come up. What do you do from there? Um, I'll start. For me, I, I usually have a, a template already typed up in LinkedIn Recruiter because, you know, at any, any one time we have multiple openings and, you know, I look at the study their profile for maybe 10 seconds and uh, decide which opening we have fits best for, for their skill set. Um, so it's, it's a lot of people are probably getting the same message for me. Um, but, you know, one 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 thing I do appreciate is when people actually respond, even if they're not like interested. Um, I think there's like quick reply features in LinkedIn. So you could just say like, thanks, but I'm not interested. And, you know, we, I document everything here. So like, it's good for me to know, like, okay, maybe this isn't the best fit for them or they might not be interested. So I, I like it when, you know, even if it's just short that, that, you know, someone acknowledges they received my message and just says they're not interested. When I find in working with clients, although someone may not be looking today, who knows what a week or so will bring in. They're like, who is that recruiter that reached out to me last month? Um, so I always encourage clients to definitely have relationships and nurture relationships with recruiters. Also with clients, what I'm hearing you say, and I'm seeing it with clients, um, often the LinkedIn process goes fast. If you get contacted by a recruiter, sometimes you can be interviewed and hired in two weeks. So definitely don't wait around if you get responsible. Uh, a message from a recruiter uh, wanting to chat with you about a potential job lead. Nicole, what else would you add on LinkedIn and how important that is for our job seekers? All right, thanks, Carolyn. Um, I would say, first of all, it um, a great platform for us, especially when um, we are doing a broader search. So, uh, and if anyone, uh, you know, has some hesitation, let's say about, um, about using LinkedIn, I, I've seen some people maybe even about the pictures and things like that. Um, having those pro professional headshots, uh, please don't put those on your resume, but having that LinkedIn profile, putting that LinkedIn link actually on your resume is okay also, but it actually helps us to see those skills. And if you utilize that that tool, you know, it kind of builds that resume for you. All those things are listed and it just gives that, that quick snap, you know, that quick snapshot of uh, what you've done. So um, like I said, it, it helps us helps us greatly to see where you've been, what you've done and uh, whether or not you will be a good fit, you know, whether or not we feel you will be a good fit for our company. So I uh, we're all for um, using that LinkedIn platform. Also, I've, I've heard um, from recruiters, if someone's not on LinkedIn, it almost seems that it's hard to take them as seriously and professionally. Um, we may have some questions about their professionalism if they're not using LinkedIn. Let's talk a little bit about interviewing. What are three interview questions that everybody should be pre prepared to answer? Dustin, from your perspective, what are some of the top interview questions and maybe a strategy or so for what is helpful for you to hear in that response from the applicant? 
Yeah, um, I feel like one question that's always asked is like, tell me about yourself, tell me about your experience, you know, walk me through your resume. That's usually one of the first questions that get asked. Uh, another question I would say is, um, you know, tell me what you know about our company or maybe like why, you know, you want to work for, for us. And then um, maybe a third one is, you know, we see it sometimes, especially with some of these, uh, you know, companies we work with, that they'll even ask like, you know, what, what do you do outside of work? Like, what are your hobbies? Um, I know for some of the software positions we hire, they like for candidates to talk about, you know, if they, you know, play video games or, or maybe take apart a, an Xbox or something and, and, and mess with the PCB board, stuff like that. So uh, those are three questions that we see uh, pretty much with every company we work with. Nicole, what are three common interview questions from your perspective that people would should be prepared to answer? Oh, that's a good one. Also, I would say um, maybe what is a, a job? Sorry about that, guys. I was having a little issue with my sound here. But um, tell me about I would say tell me about a job or a position that you've been in or that you felt was a great fit for you and why uh, what you liked about the job. Uh, also, maybe uh, about a job where you were challenged, you know, or something within that job that you were challenged in. And, um, you know, how did you, you know, what happened with that? And using that STAR method, you know, what happened, you know, the situation, how did you approach it? And what was the result? You know, I don't think that STAR method is going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and I would say being honest and upfront about um, uh, pay and your salary. You know, I think, you know, some of us, some people are a little reluctant and kind of held back and about that. But I mean, honestly, that's why you're seeking, you know, that's, that's why we're, you know, interviewing you, you know, of course. And so I, I would say not to be um, too afraid to actually speak about that, you know, towards the end of the, the interview when take, take advantage of that end of the interview when we actually ask you if you have questions, you know, don't be afraid to, um, to ask those questions. And just to allude a little more, that STAR method that Nicole is referring to for behavioral and situational interview questions, which you will be asked a couple of those in almost every single interview, tell a short story giving a very specific example using the STAR acronym. What was the situation or task you faced? What action did you take? And what was the result? How did it turn out? Using metrics if you can, or how maybe what you did was implemented to other departments or teams or became part of the manual. Have some of those stories ready to go. Um, common examples of those type questions. If anyone's going to be dealing with the public in their job, a question would be, tell me about a time you dealt with an angry customer. Or if there's teamwork involved, tell me about a time when one person was not carrying the weight, their weight on the team. Uh, these are going to be situations that you would encounter in the job you're interviewing for, and they want to see how you've handled that in the past. So telling a short related story on how you've done that in the past is what they're looking for. Rodney, what else would you add on common interview questions that everybody needs to be prepared to have an answer for? Well, one of the first ones we deal with is the motivation of why. Why did you apply or why are you open for work? Uh, tell them, you know, why specifically this job? And, you know, is it, is it a money thing? Is it an environment thing that you're having uh, to deal with or just looking for new opportunities? But tell me, uh, you know, sell me on it why you're applying and uh, why we should proceed to the next steps as well. And sometimes, you know, you know oh, I just want to apply to see what happens or something of that nature. Or if they can explain to you that, well, I am limited on my growth here at this company. So, you know, I am looking for this uh, uh, opportunity because I can see growth into this uh, opportunity. And then to Dustin's effect of, uh, you know, what do you know about the uh, company uh, that you're applying for or what we're uh, dealing with? Do you, you know, do you know what they do or uh, uh, what they produce or anything of that nature? Show me that you've got some buy-in from your perspective to let us know. But our biggest key is, you know, why? Uh, why did you apply? Why did you send me your resume or why did you respond to this? Uh, and they're all, I'm always open is a good answer in certain things, but it's, I need a little bit more of uh, specifically why this opportunity at this time. Awesome. Thank you. 
Um, next, let's hear from maybe one person on what advice you have for follow-up. How should the job seeker follow up with you? Who'd like to take that one? That's I can, I, yeah, I could take that one. Uh, we're, we're trying to be a lot better about sending thank you notes right after the interview. Um, I will say historically, because um, our, our interview process moves really fast. Sometimes there's not enough gap in there to actually, you know, because usually we get 24 hour feedback on, you know, a candidate, but uh, we are making a bigger push to, to send just a brief thank you. You know, I would love to work, you know, especially if they're interested, like, hey, I would love to work here for this reason and just kind of restate maybe what you discussed in the interview. Okay, awesome. Before I wind up with my prepared questions, please go ahead and send us some questions in the chat box. Um, what are some questions that our audience would like to ask our panel today? Now is your chance. Uh, so send us some of those questions and we'll address those. Um, what advice would you have for mid-career changers? Um, we're all going to have lots of jobs in our career, um, but mid-career changers, what advice would you have for them? Who'd like to start with that one? I will go uh, with that is uh, be prepared uh, to, you know, have all your ducks in a row of the, why you're doing this look at the job that you're going to or the career changes you're going to evaluate all the aspects of that job from the skills the qualities that are needed and the value or salaries that are required for that um, and you know take that all into consideration as you you know do your search and try to uh, get the initial interview but i would have to say in my honest opinion, persistence and with that is going to be a big key because uh, that you're coming in with not maybe the years of experience and the specifics of what they have, but you may be able to translate that uh, if you you can get lucky enough to get an interview by your persistence. That's when the power of the network definitely comes in where someone can maybe speak on behalf of your um, characteristics, other successes you've had um, to help that interviewer selection committee maybe see beyond um, exactly what they're looking for to give you a chance for that interview. What advice would you have regarding references? Then we'll start taking some of our questions. How should we be prepping our references and what kinds of questions do you ask references? I'll, I'll take that one because that's another um, change that we've made recently. We're, we're trying to slow down the speed up is what we say at Actolin and uh, reference checks for candidates is a, is a huge uh, emphasis for us. But um, definitely one thing that, that, you know, obviously make sure that the reference you list is going to speak positively about you. Thankfully, I don't see it too often here, but there has been situations where I've called a former manager and, you know, I would say their, their endorsement is lukewarm at best. And to me, that's, there's, there's some disconnect there, right? Like the candidate either has it, it's been so long since they worked there, or there was a, you know, maybe a negative reason why they, they're no longer working there. Um, but, you know, especially for, for engineering, like we definitely, because it is so highly technical, we definitely want at least one manager that you work for. Peer references are okay, but um, to me, I'm more concerned with talking to somebody that, you know, was around this person every day that knows their technical skill set very well and can, you know, adequately tell me what they can and cannot do. Okay, Nicole, would you like to add anything to that? Um, absolutely. I can mimic exactly what Dustin um, has said, you know, especially what I've mentioned earlier is like, is it reaching out to those references, letting them know that you're actually going to use them as a reference, um, you know, checking to make sure that they're, um, like you said, that the reference that you're actually listing is going to be a good one. Uh, accuracy, whether or not they're still at the company. Uh, if they need, if you actually, if the job is requesting that you have a letter, uh, uh, you know, a, a letterhead or whatever it may be, giving that reference enough time um, to actually create that document, you know, not reaching out to them a couple of days ahead of time. I mean, emergencies happen, but uh, being mindful and giving them time to actually sit down and, and write that letter and um, list their experience of working with you alongside you or supervising you. Um, 
But yeah, those are some of the key ones that I have. And if you, I'm sorry, what Dustin mentioned, if you can use a professional reference, of course, that is preferred because we want to know, like you said, about someone. Of course, peers are, are okay, but most of the time we do want that professional reference from a leader, some type of leader also. So, Rodney, I'm going to have you take a little bit different slant on this one. What if somebody is conducting a confidential job search and an application asks for your supervisor's name? How do you maneuver that area where you don't really want your supervisor to know? And then at what point do you involve them? Talk us through that. Uh, that is a definitely a, uh, a scenario that can present itself, but we could always go back to maybe the previous job or someone that has left the company that you have a relationship with that can give us some information uh, about you uh, and can uh, be uh, in place of your direct supervisor uh, that you have. We, this is where, we, where you're building the relationship with the individual and you're talking to them and finding out why. And if it is in that situation, we uh, here at Anchor Point, we definitely will take that as a priority of not you know, letting any of your current work uh, members know about it or anything like that and uh, go to, like I say, most cases, there's probably somebody you've worked with that's no longer with the company or at a previous job than that. They can at least get us um, your first reference that we can work with and get some things written down and then uh, we can proceed from there. But that's that's where you have a, the client or in this case, the candidate uh, and the hiring manager or the uh, recruiter uh, has a relationship of knowing exactly why you're uh, applying for this job and uh, how do we need to proceed. Okay, excellent. Um, we've had a question come in about salary. Um, Lindsay, will you share that question and we'll have our panel um, discuss it. And, you know, obviously different companies have different perspectives, um, different recruiters have different styles. Um, so will you ask, um, share with us the question that came in? The question is, is based on what Nicole said, is it okay to ask about salary in the first interview? They've recently left a job that they had for 15 years and it's been a while since they were on an interview. Okay. Rodney, what's your per, your opinion on talking salary at the beginning? I mean, it, it, you can mention the salary and uh, let us know your requirements. Now, the one thing I would say is to research what the market is, the area that you're at, the years of experience that you're having. Um, you can definitely let us know what your requirements are. Um, in our instance, we definitely will try to present that up front as well and but we do not let that be a immediate uh blockade at the beginning okay because sometimes even if you come in if you're coming to extreme high then we'll just let you know that's not right but if it's if it's above what they had but we're like you still have a talent uh, you know set those expectations at the beginning we'll see what they say uh at that point but uh uh yes please uh, by all means uh, it helps us understand that uh, this the the role may not be exactly for you because your requirements are not really in the match but it also may say well let's look at total compensation packages and things like this to put it in a uh, a, a package for you to review dustin what would you add to that yeah i mean it's i'm i think rodney and i are kind of in the same line of work like if you're working with a recruiter or a talent acquisition specialist, definitely let them know your salary requirements. Because I, you know, one thing I pride myself on, like I don't want to waste somebody's time if you know for twenty thousand dollars off. And I and I know this company that we've worked with over and over again, and I can just be like, hey, they're not going to pay you that much. But as far as we, we usually coach our candidates in the interview to not bring it up in because we want them in the interview to talk about look at what we discussed, like why they want to work for this company. Uh, and we just, cause we're, we're kind of like their agent at the end of the day. Um, and then I would say just, if you are, if you're not working with a recruiter and you're just applying for a job, I mean, most jobs, I feel like, or most companies will, will list the salary range. Um, I, I think it's a fair question if they don't list it and you get an interview to definitely bring it up there, you know, at some point during the interview, just, but, um, you know, for, for what we do, it's, it's definitely, yeah, the recruiter needs to know, but we usually tell them during the interview not to bring it up. 
I always appreciate it when the person calling to set up a screening interview or just to check in and see if you're interested. I appreciate it when they come right out and say, this job is in this range. Are you interested in talking further? So yeah, companies that do that, I appreciate that very much. For our job seekers, whenever you are contacted uh, about a potential interview, a few questions I always encourage clients to ask. Um, ask for a copy of the full job description. Sometimes what you're seeing is a very abbreviated version of that. So ask if they could email you that in preparation for the interview. Also ask who will be on the selection committee who you're going to be meeting with so that you can go to LinkedIn or do some networking and uh, with people in your contacts and see if you can find out some information about that person or their career path um, or and or obviously researching the company as much as possible. Um, I did want to mention, Car oh, no, I'm sorry. I did want to mention uh, something that you uh, uh, highlighted, Carolyn, is, is that in our screening process, uh, in steps, I should say, in our screening process, that uh, tour at the very end of our screening, we do discuss the pay range. And it is for reasons that Dustin and Rodney mentioned, uh, you know, hey, we don't want to waste anyone's time. So if it's unrealistic, then we want to be fair and say it's unrealistic, but by no means, as Rodney had mentioned, there may be some wiggle room there. I just want people to know that, hey, towards the end, when you get to ask questions, it's okay to ask about your pay. Yeah. I'm going to bring up one other thing just real mm -hmm. quick, kind of what uh, on what Dustin said about once you get into the interview and Nicole and our jobs are the same, we're screening and making sure that all the uh, things are matched up to the hiring manager. The hiring manager themselves, they're wanting a person that's got the job, what the requirements and fits into that job. They honestly leave the salary and everything up to what HR has established and everything like that. So they really don't want to discuss that because they really, honestly, they can't control. The hiring managers, uh, unless they own the company themselves, uh, they have to go into what the HR uh, you know, regulations say for this role at this point that they have. So you know, we'll know that, the screeners will know that at the beginning to get that out in the open so we don't waste anybody's time. But once you get into actual interviews with the hiring managers and things of that nature, that, that shouldn't be brought up at that point. Because like I say, that's something that they really – they're not so much worried about at that point. They're trying to find out if you are the best person for the job. That's to be safe and they can fall in love with you first. Yes. <laughs> See that you have the skills they cannot live without. That, that's true. And, and that could get you an extra 5,000 if they like, oh my gosh, this guy is exactly what we need. A girl has exactly what we need and beyond. And they're like, we're, we're not going to lose this person. So uh, that's just my little extra tidbit. Definitely a good point. We want to get to the second date. All right, we do have a question from an audience member. For contract and permanent roles, how many interviews is too many interviews? Okay, for contract <laughs> roles well, permanent I roles. Can, I can uh, attest to that because we deal with a lot of contracts. Um, we try to um, educate the hiring managers and the companies that this market right now is not like it used to be to where you could, you know, take two or three weeks and three interviews or four interviews. We, we honestly recommend them to do two interviews, uh, no more than three to make a decision, because by the time they do that, if this candidate is of any value, some other company may be able to match them up and you're going to miss them out with that. So that's uh, where, and again, as me as a corporate recruiter back in the day, I would tell my hiring managers, you know, we need to set this up. If you feel this person has this, then we set up a, a panel interview and evaluate and pull the trigger. I do think just like buying a house right now, you've got to be a lot faster on the hiring process. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Okay. I'd like for each of our panelists to share a parting thought or two with our audience. Um, we have one more question, and then our panelists can be thinking of that while we have our last question from the audience. If we're currently in a job, how fast should we expect to be leaving that job and starting the new one? I mean, we, we always think, you know, two weeks notice is, is pretty standard. Um, to me, it's, it's like, you know, if, if you ever get in a situation where someone's like, well, we need you here next week, that, that's a kind of a red flag for me because... 
you know, two weeks is pretty standard in, in, in our industry for sure. I would say that's in general uh, the what you advise to, but mm -hmm. I, I would put it at the, the situation that is at hand and what what was going on. As it, the one thing you want to do is communicate with your previous employer uh, as much as possible as well. But you really you've always got to take care of yourself, and if you feel like it's a, a move that you know you can make, and um, the two weeks is not really going to work out, but maybe one week you can do that. Um, you know, I would say, you know, you, you've got to evaluate that for yourself. What is the most beneficial thing for yourself uh, there? But in general, you know, giving anybody two weeks should be plenty of time to uh, uh, walk with a, uh, a good, uh, a good impression. Um, I'm going to say, uh, uh, just like you said, piggybacking what uh, Rodney and Dustin said that two weeks is the average, but depending on the nature of the position, I want to say, you know, how professional the position is, you know, an example would be nursing. And you know, I, I, some people I worked in, in with nursing, uh, recruiting for uh, for years and a given, um, you know, five to six weeks, no, four, I was just say four to six weeks notice um, is ideal in those type of positions. But of course, as Rodney mentioned, depending on the nature of why you're, why you are leaving a job, whether it's for another job, whether it's for a family emergency, whatever the case may be. Um, but on average, a couple of weeks is ideal. And of course, if your supervisor or manager that you're working with says, Hey, you know, um, you say, Hey, you know what? I really need to leave in a week or whatever. And they're okay with that. Then that's great. But you definitely want to have that, uh, discussion. Once you solidify that you have that other position, you really want to have that discussion because of course we don't want to burn bridges here yeah. and you may need that person as a future reference. So you just, you want to keep those things in mind also. So taking all of those uh, things into consideration, um, would be great when making that choice, what's best for you, uh, what your company standards and requirements are when it comes to giving notices uh, or even transferring into another position, let's say within your company, uh, whatever, the, the, whatever the situation may be, you want to consider all factors when making those choices. Also, in following your company's policy, if they do have a minimum amount, because otherwise it will go in your file if you left prematurely that you're not eligible for rehire ever. So you never know when you might want to go back to your former company at some point 10 years down the road and that record would still be there. So definitely make sure you follow that guideline. All right, let's have some party words and then we'll go into the last part of our program. Dustin, what advice would you have or encouragement for our job seekers today? Ooh, um, I mean, I think one thing I, and I, I have to learn this just as a recruiter is patience. Like, you know, I, I mean, I've had you know, consultants that it, it might take them five interviews before they finally get a job. And we see this a lot with like entry level people, but I mean, obviously people in, in this forum are probably people that have worked a lot longer than that. It's just a lot of this stuff is just timing. And, um, you know, it, it, I feel like it always kind of works out. It's just, it just, you know, you, you want it to be you know, the right opportunity for you and your family. And, uh, it doesn't always work out right at, at first. And, um, you know, some, some of the customers that we have, you know, I don't have any hair, but if I, if I still had it, they'd make me want to pull my hair out because they take so long. And it's just, uh, I've had to kind of learn, uh, learn patience myself, but uh, I just feel like if you just, you know, stay, you know, be persistent as we, we, we talked about and just, just, it'll, it'll work out. It just, it takes some time. It always takes longer than we think it will. Nicole, what parting words do you have for our audience today? I, uh, would definitely say, first of all, uh, thank you all for attending Job Club. Continue to, to attend Job Club. <laughs> but um, I would say, honestly, to treat your job search, uh, if you're in the middle of a job search, treat your job search as a job. Um, and, and I cannot enforce that enough. Um, actually, you know, getting up as you would for a job, getting dressed as you would for a job, even if you're sitting at a coffee table, if you have to go to the library, Starbucks, wherever it may be, but treat your job search like a job and give it that time, give it that attention and the detail um, that is needed because you are selling yourself. You are selling yourself and just, so putting out just a uh, application here, application there, don't get me wrong, that's great. But when you, you wanna put out the best applications, you wanna really take time on that resume and that cover letter, research the jobs that you're looking for and um, sell yourself. Don't, you know, don't, you know, make the recruiters dig for what you should already be putting there for us to see. So really treat that job search like your job until you get a job. 
And Rodney, you round us out. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just going to say ditto to everything that they said there. There, there is some things about persistence. There is also uh, about um, take the time and effort for any job that you apply for to curtail your resume cover letter specifically for that job. If you go to a career fair like at UK, look at what companies are going to be there. Have resumes, if you're interested, and most of them will tell, post their jobs automatically what they have. Have resumes or cover letters specifically for each one of those. Don't come and just blank at a resume. I'm a, what's your uh, objective? To obtain a job. Of course, everybody is there. But if you can put something that says, okay, I see uh, you've got this role at this company and it's got the company's name on it. And then all the job descriptions is in that resume. That's going on top of the file. That's going to be somebody that's going to be reached out. So there is a little bit of work that needs to be done for every uh, application or job opportunity that you seek. Do your due diligence on that and you will separate yourself from the, uh, the, the talent pool very, very quickly. Thank you to our awesome panelists today. Let's show some love in that chat box for our awesome panelists. And Diana is going to bring the meeting to a close. We do have one recruiter here to hear from about job leads. And um, Diana is going to come and take us home now. Well, what an awesome uh, experience that was. I think uh, the so many, so many uh, areas of concern and issues with the job search was covered and we just can't thank enough those uh, panelists that were willing to volunteer their time to share with us today. It's always one of our uh, favorite, favorite sessions. All right, well, we, this is the time uh, to consider who's hiring and employers with leads. Uh, please make your way to the podium right now. We do have uh, someone in, in, um, in person, and this is Jeremy McKinley, and he is with the UKHR department, and he has much to share with us. Jeremy, I think this is your first time to be with us. It is. It is. Right. Um, first, I'd like to thank the panel. There was a lot of really, really good information in there. Hello, Nicole. She's a colleague of mine. Um, as a former recruiter myself, I can't like reemphasize all the good facts and information they shared. But um, I'm here to talk a little bit about um, the job opportunities at the University of Kentucky. Um, sometimes people think, and as many times as I talk to interested applicants, I think we're just an academic institution and only healthcare, but I really want to change kind of the conversation around what type of opportunities are available at the university. Um, there is such a broad array of different career fields. If you are interested in kind of the academic side, there's academic advisors and positions that support that. But we have everything from grounds workers to security officers to office assistants who support students in the residence halls. All of these opportunities are available daily on the UK Jobs website. That's ukjobs.uky.edu. I highly encourage everybody to go in there and take a look at the opportunities. Um, there's some nice new features on job alerts where you can get emails every day of the new job opportunities that have opened on the previous day. So you're not having to go to the website and hunt those down. They can kind of be fed to you based on the particular job categories that you're interested in. Um, but I also highly encourage you to check out that website as well because Rodney um, kind of mentioned career fairs. The university's second career fair, so university-wide career fair, is on Saturday, May 13th. If you go to the ukjobs.uky.edu website, you'll see a big, bold banner at the top for yourself to get registered. Um, and as Rodney kind of mentioned, too, it's a great opportunity for you to get kind of into conversations with the variety of departments that we have and just have them, you know, hand off resumes, have some conversations about their culture, the type of opportunities that they have then or maybe in the future. So there's a lot of goodness kind of in getting yourself registered and attending. It's going to be at our Gatton Student Center. Again, that's Saturday, May 13th. I've reminded people that is the day before Mother's Day. So if you want to make your mom happy, go tell her you attended your job fair. If your mom needs a job, have her come along. Just some bonding time for the both of you there. So highly encourage um, all of you to kind of go check out the website because again, you know, most people think we're an academic institution, They, you know, in which we are, but we support the community here in Lexington and the state and so many broad and, and you know, 
interesting ways that if you don't take the time to go look, you'll miss a good opportunity that may be at hand. So um, again, a variety of things, you know, covering different, you know, I saw somebody in the chat mention about administrative jobs, patient relations assistance on the healthcare side, if you're interested in that, admin staff support positions on the academic side. So Nicole, give a big thumbs up for that. There's plenty of opportunities there. Um, so certainly just kind of take some time, get familiar with the website, get yourself set up even if it's just to attend the job fair, but to get more familiar with the opportunities that we have available. So, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, and we will hope that all of you will put that date on your calendars. Uh, we will include that information in our e email newsletter this afternoon. So, um, that's great, great news. I think we have some online, uh, someone that would like Okay, we have give you a minute to uh, to announce a, a job lead there, Krista. Oh, hey guys, uh, I'm such a huge fan of Job Club, as you know. Keep coming! What a great presentation today. Um, I'm with Direct Employers Association, and we're a nonprofit uh, company based out of Indianapolis. But we're hiring a remote software developer, Java C Sharp. If you've got uh, three years of experience or more, um, I encourage you to check us uh, check us out. It is a remote position. Um, if you have any qualified candidates, send them our way. Also, I'm going to put in the chat for the U.S. National Labor Exchange that we co-host with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies. You can utilize that to search jobs, internships, apprenticeships, employers, uh, et cetera, throughout the state, as well as our DE job site for global search. Um, and we are actually now hosting the Kentucky Career Portal for the Kentucky Career Centers as well. So I'll put that new link in there too, as they've transitioned um, away from focused careers over to utilizing uh, the U.S. National Labor Exchange. So hopefully that'll help uh, get some folks uh, employed and advanced in their careers. Thanks so much. Thank you. And if you'll uh, send that our way, we'll include that in our newsletter as well. Well, now it's time to discuss and to share Job Club facilitators' news and programs. And we'll begin with Cooperative Extension. And uh, just a shout out to all the local extension offices in, throughout Kentucky. And uh, we are most uh, pleased there are 120. So we want to invite you, encourage you to check out your local extension office and their offerings this spring. Uh, I do want to mention one here at the Fayette County Extension Office. Kentucky Proud Evenings has resumed. And on uh, Wednesday, May the 17th, Randolph Paul Runyon, the assistant Assault and Alicia Green, The Assault of Alicia Green. Uh, book will be reviewed, and so you will want to experience that wonderful evening here uh, with Kentucky Proud, Proud uh, Foods. So just call the Extension Office Fayette County for more details on that, as well as visiting your local extension. Um, any, any updates from UK Steps? Nicole? Yes, there are. I'm sorry. Uh, caught me off guard there. I do have a few. Let's see here if I get my camera on for you guys again. Okay, there we go. All righty. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. All righty. So I do have a few updates. And of course, uh, as Diana and Carolyn have already mentioned, we will have the um, links to the job sent out in our newsletter later today. So if you have not signed up for that, uh, please get signed up for that with Job Club and we'll get all the uh, the uh, job details. Uh, well, we'll have the link so that you can review those job details and apply if it's interesting to you. So some of the jobs that we're going to highlight, once again, I want to mention that these are not limited. These are just some of the jobs that we're going to highlight. I uh, have a patient services coordinator position, a hospital clerk, an office assistant position, a pharmacy intern, as a pharmacy intern senior, I should mention, a research assistant in, in the Department of Psychology. Uh, our, we do we're, um, have our SRNA program um, starting again. That's kind of a, a, an annual seasonal thing there and an office assistant position. Once again, those are not limited positions as Jeremy mentioned, but these are just some of the jobs that we're highlighting and we'll get those all sent out to you guys. Thank you, Nicole. UK Alumni Career Services. Uh, I know a big week is uh, approaching and uh, Caroline and, and, and group and associates are really excited about that. 
all that news will be in our newsletter as well, but there are all types of leadership opportunities this week. So you can go online to register. It's a leadership uh, conversation and presentation. So uh, they are getting a great response from that. So uh, we encourage you to check that out as well. Next time at Job Club, May the 9th, preparing for your next interview. And this is presented by Audrey Jones, and she is with Fayette County Government. So we'll be anxious to hear that perspective from a government employee. So we have the registration information on the screen. It'll be in your newsletter. Uh, we encourage you to be with us. Uh, that interview process is the most important because that's your initially your, your final step before the hire. So Join us, and we look forward to it. On behalf of the Cooperative Extension Service, UK Alumni Association, and UK HR Department, we thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.